Hello everybody, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today we're going to be taking a first look at an upcoming game that's called Panzer Corps 2. It is the sequel to, as you guessed it, Panzer Corps 1. Uh, it is published by Matrix and Slytherin Games. Uh, this is the sequel to, I can't remember the year it came out, I think it was 2012 uh, is when Panzer Corps 1 came out. Panzer Corps 1 was very much a spiritual successor to the Panzer General series. It's a turn-based strategy game with linked scenarios uh, and a somewhat branching campaign. Panzer Corps 2 is continuing the tradition on. There's a number of enhancements that are being made with this game. Uh, I was given access to a preview build of this game. The game is not out yet. It comes out on March 19th. And um, I was given access to a preview build of the game. So this isn't a final version of the game, but this will be our first look at Panzer Corps 2 here playing through it today. Uh, this is going to be um, a preview build that I think gives me access to 12 scenarios uh, and access to one of the campaigns. So this is a game that supports multiplayer. It also has uh, individual scenarios where you can play through. There's only a couple in the in the preview build right now uh, where you can play through individual turn-based battles or you can fight through campaigns that kind of branch throughout the Second World War. Starting in Poland in 1939, looks like there's going to be a Russian campaign, a North African campaign, and then a late Russian campaign in Kursk and an Italian 43 campaign. These are actually very similar to the histor or not the historical, but to the original Panzer General. These are the exact same campaigns that came with Panzer General, uh, Panzer General One, which had a Poland start date, uh, a Russian invasion start date, North Africa in 41, and then also sort of a 43 start on the Western Front in Italy, or on the Russian Front at Kursk. Um, with that being said, we're going to play in the Poland campaign. It's the only campaign I have access to right now. We're going to play on standard difficulty, uh, and we're going to go ahead and jump in here and see what we have to, uh, to do here. All right, so uh, this actually immediately allows me to have a choice. So rather than throwing me into sort of the standard Panzer General battle where you're trying to take Lutz and, uh, and uh, the, the gates to Warsaw in the first Poland scenario as Panzer General had... This is sort of, uh, you pick either Poland North or Poland South. So, it says, As a newly minted general in the German Wehrmacht, it falls upon you to spearhead the German invasion of Poland and prove your mettle in combat. Always choose your avenue of assault wisely, as future decisions will dramatically impact your campaign and even the course of the war. I wonder if they're going to do this for every battle where you have a choice. Uh, so here's the strategic warning. Basically, we can choose either Poland South or Poland North. In Poland North, we will get access to prototype equipment. Uh, if we, I guess the reward for Poland North is access to prototype equipment. If we play Poland st South, we get bonus prestige. Uh, prestige being the thing that you, you use to buy reinforcements or new units or other things like that. Let's go ahead and play Poland North, which basically is us cutting off the Danzig Corridor. Uh, and driving into northern Poland. Um, so we'll go ahead and do that. I like the idea of, of sort of prototype units. Now, in this case, we are going to be creating our general. So it looks like we actually uh, get to pick between a couple of different sort of stock images for German generals. Uh, and then we can type in our name here. So we'll just go with THG. Uh, we have apparently different strengths and attributes which are going to influence the campaign. So that's kind of an interesting little twist. Um, so for example, we have one selection remaining right now, which means we can choose that we're a Panzer General, which makes tanks cheaper by 25%. That's pretty considerable. So we'll go ahead and do that. Now we can get more traits if we pick some weaknesses. So for example, we, uh, by the way, so you've got all these different options. Infantry General makes infantry cheaper. Panzer General makes tanks cheaper. Industry Connections gives us uh, access to more prototypes in every mission, except for the first one. Uh, Liberator, which is kind of ironical, playing as the Germans, you're not going to be liberating anything, but um, gives you a bonus for prestige when you capture flags. Deep Recon uh, gives you, I guess, more reconnaissance. Operational Initiative gives you more initiative, which must be some kind of bonus in, in fighting battles. Master of Blitzkrieg gives you more movement points for your tanks. Battle Academy gives you more experience. Auxiliary Force gives you extra slots for non-core units. So one of the key concepts of Panzer General and Panzer Corps is this idea of you building up a core force. So in these branching campaigns, you build up a cadre of soldiers that you carry with you from battle to battle, and you can gain more experience and build those units up. There are 
are auxiliary units as well, which you don't carry over battle to battle. And so this would give you extra auxiliary units. Uh, Trophies of War uh, gets two times more captured enemy equipment, so apparently you can capture enemy equipment. That's new. That didn't exist in Panzer Corps 1, I don't think. Uh, And two times more prestige when forcing enemy units to surrender. Uh, Deadly Grasp influences encircled units uh, with double the penalties. Flexible Command allows you to split units, so that's another new feature where you can actually split units in half. Killer Team, you start with three additional heroes. Heroes are a thing in this game that weren't really in the first game, but apparently you can get hero units, which are even more effective and better in combat. Um, Anti-Air Veteran gives you better... uh, Actually, so anti-aircraft units inflict outright kills instead of suppression. Okay, so anti-air apparently is primarily a suppression thing. And then Perimeter Control, which cancels enemy zone of control uh, in that hex. So we'll stick with Panzer General for our first trait. Now, in addition to that, you get a whole bunch of weaknesses that you can choose from. So inept logistics, as you would expect, no overstrength. Uh, as you can see here, that would like limit your units to, I think, 10. Uh, I think 10 is the base uh, strength of a unit, but you can, you can OP them. Uh, you can prevent yourself from being able to buy aircraft or artillery, which feels like that would be pretty massive. Um, you get retrograde, which gives your units access to new equipment later. Green army is what you would expect. Delayed reinforcements, also what you would expect. Poor maintenance means units can lose movement points for breakdowns. Chaotic fire makes them less, uh, actually makes them spend more ammo. So I guess they're more profligate with ammunition expenditure. Inefficient supply reduces, uh, supply at the beginning of the turn. Poor ground control. The enemy can move through your zone of control. Bad luck means you have bad luck in your combat rolls. Trench slog, which will slow down reducing fortified troops. Slow modernization and fear of the unknown. So pretty interesting. This is all a new mechanic where you pick your strengths and weaknesses. I will go with one weakness, and I'm going to go with inefficient supply. So units get reduced supply at the beginning of their turn. That feels like a problem, actually. That might be a bad choice, but we'll see how that goes. So I'll go with inefficient supply, and then I'll also go with battle academy because I want to get more experience. So that might be a problem when we move to the Russian front, but we'll see how that all works out. All right, so now we're moving into the battle. Uh, You can see here we're starting with our briefing, so you get... uh, I don't hear any voice acting. I really hope there is voice acting in the final version of the game. It's obviously not yet finalized yet, um, but this is very different. In the previous version of the game, there was voice acting that would kind of narrate the the briefing here. Uh, In this case, it looks like there's kind of a little script, a little play that's going on with this gentleman on the phone... Uh, he's uh, sort of talking as if, you know, yeah, I'm here. I'm I'm with the general that you're talking about. Someone on the other end of the line is talking. Are you certain they're ready for frontline combat? Okay. Um, so it's talking about Operation Fallweiss, which is the invasion of Poland. Something about someone recommending you. Um, the wise old man in charge here is apparently our superior, but he's being ordered to give us a command, uh, even though he's skeptical of us. And now he's going to give us a briefing here. So I've got to click through this manually. You can see here, these are the objectives that we want to take. These three green hexed cities. Um, I don't think the northern one is an objective, but these three cities here are all objectives. I'm not going to try and pronounce those. That I don't want to offend any uh, anyone who's Polish because I definitely cannot pronounce Polish words. Um, so those three cities are what we're trying to take here. It's in the Danzig corridor. We're trying to cut off sort of the, the Polish forces to the north in Danzig and then the Polish troops uh, in the south advancing toward the Vistula R- River. The enemy presumably will attempt to attack the flank of our advance, so we're trying to attack there in the south, but it's saying enemy advances will come here toward the north, so we should advance north along this roadway to cut off their counteroffensive and then turn south. So essentially set up a blocking force up here in the north while the rest of our troops advance in the south. Um, We want to take these cities here. It looks like to fully take control of the corridor, take these two major crossings on the Vistula River, plus this other city here to the west. Um, and then you also, if you take the city in the west, then you can cross a bridge down here and flank into the south of these cities. Rather than going a frontal assault over these bridges, over the Vistula River, you can use this crossing in the south, flank in behind them, uh, and then uh, you'll have an easier time of it. Um, so that kind of gives you the suggestion, and that's the end of the briefing. So we'll go ahead and end the briefing. This is the deployment phase. So you can see we already have some units on the map here. It looks like we've got the third Ver infantry, and we can actually click on this and change this. So we could change the first pioneer to whatever, you know, I can just highlight and change the name to whatever I want it to be. Um, THGs. Um, I don't know. Uh, uh, I don't know. 
Um, I, I don't know. We'll just call him the first pile. Uh, already, it already changes the name to Pioneer anyway, so whatever. First Pio Pioneers. Um, so you can see here we have several units here. We've got some Pioneers, which are like en engineers, I believe. We've got some Ver Infantry, which I believe is just sort of standard infantry. We've got a 75 millimeter or 7.5 centimeter artillery piece down here. We also have three armored un units, uh, a Panzer 1B, a Panzer 2C, and another Panzer 2C. We know of one Polish unit up here in the north, an infantry unit in the north. And again, our objective is to drive east along this roadway here to block any counteroffensive moving south while another column of ours moves along this roadway in the south to take these key cities. Um, so I think what we're going to do here is we are going to buy some more units. Now we have 1200 prestige up here which is your, your currency, your money. It's how you buy more units and we have 21 out of a potential 36 core slots. So the core slots are the maximum number of units that I believe you can carry over turn to turn. Um, so if we have uh, core slots uh, up to 36, that's the army which you deploy in this mission. More powerful units occupy more slots, uh, and then you can have less of them in your army. So, for example, well, first thing we're going to do is we're going to click on this dollar bill sign up here. By the way, there's some other information. You can see the victory objectives here with that I. You can see your different unit stats here by clicking on this. It'll show you the unit stats down here on the left for the unit that you click on. I'm not going to go through all of these, but it kind of gives you a cost, the number of slots, the type of movement, uh, how good they are at spotting, soft attack, hard attack, that kind of a thing. Um, we're going to click un unclick that, and then we're going to go to purchase units. So we've got 15 core slots that we can occupy. I think I'm going to go a little bit infantry heavy, so I'm going to go with a gren I'm going to go with a couple of grenadier units. Grenadier infantry are basically heavy infantry. You can see by the graphic on here, they it looks like they all have machine guns, but it's basically heavy weapons infantry units. So they're good against hard targets. They're also good against enemy infantry. Um, it looks like they're actually the best infantry that we have. Our cavalry has the same attack against fellow infantry, uh, and our Ver infantry is actually similarly good against soft targets here, which are of enemy infantry, but our grenadiers have a 9 rating against hard attacks, which represents things like tanks and stuff. Uh, so these guys are sort of the best all-around infantry. They cost 170 prestige. We're actually going to upgrade them to having Opal Blitzes, which is basically truck support, so they can move further distances. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to add them to the basket. That will cost three core slots, so it'll move us up from 21 to 24, and it'll cost 230 of our 1,200 uh, points. So we're actually going to do that for a couple of our units. We're going to add... Um, I guess we'll do three Grenadier units for 690 prestige points and nine of our core slots. That leaves us with six more core slots uh, to use up. We're also going to go over here and click on a fighter unit. We're going to purchase one BF-109, uh, Messerschmitt BF-109. It's the only fighter option we have. So the different in the different types of units you have, you have infantry, you have tanks, you have recon reconnaissance units, anti-tank, anti-air, artillery, fighters, tactical bombers, and strategic bombers all to choose from. We are going to go ahead and choose a BF-109. We already have a Stuka dive bomber on the map as part of our unit. So we'll go ahead and buy a BF-109. That'll bring our total expense up to 12. So that brings us up to 33. Uh, and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to purchase a DO-17Z, which is a strategic bomber that only takes up one core slot. So we're going to go ahead and add that. That almost brings us up to our max, but we still have a little bit of room left. So we are going to buy a Panzer 38 t a, which is our best tank at this point. Um, you can see here we've got a Panzer 1, you've got a Panzer 1B, a 2C, and a Panzer 35T. I'm not sure, like, if the upgrade path matters, then the Panzer 2C might actually be the best option. But I'm going to buy the Panzer 38TA for a couple of reasons. First off, one thing I think is worth pointing out is when you when you hover over a unit, if you look down here on the lower right, uh, you'll see that you get a score. And the score on top is the unit you currently have selected, and the score on the bottom is the unit that you have, you're have you hovering over. So it allows you to really easily compare different types of units and how effective they are. If you look across the board, the Panzer 38, and it, by the way, when you have a, a, a unit that is better than the other one, it'll be green if the unit you have selected is better than the alternative, um, or, or vice versa. So if there's a comparison and one of them is better than another, it'll be green. If they're inferior, it'll be red. So you can actually see here that the Panzer 38TA is actually superior to everything else that we have, and generally you pay, you get what you pay for. So we'll go ahead and we'll add one of these Panzers to the basket, so that'll give us a uh, another tank here 
uh, to roll with. So we're going with uh, one tank, one strategic bomber, one BF-109, and three grenadier infantry units here. And that's what we're going to deploy. We're going to deploy the infantry up here in the north. We'll deploy one in the south. Uh, I guess we'll deploy two in the north. We'll deploy one of those armored units up here as well. And then the fighters and the uh, the bombers kind of go over the airfields as well. So at that point, we've deployed all our units. You can see our core is completely filled out, a maximum 36 out of a potential 36. And our prestige is completely spent at 50. So we only have 50 prestige left to spend on new units or reinforcements. So we'll go ahead and end our deployment here, and now the battle will begin. I'm going to go ahead and get, you can see a summary of all your units on the left. I'm going to go ahead and toggle that option away. And now you can see here's the map. Now one of the big differences with Panzer Corps uh, 2 is that it is fully 3D. So the actual units on the map here you can see are 3D counters rather than sort of the 2D sprite type approach for Panzer Corps 1. So if you're into the 3D approach, that could be a big difference for you. If you don't really care, then it may not matter, but it doesn't meaningfully affect the game other than just visually. We can use the mouse wheel to scroll in and out and look at the map. You can see here these are our three objectives, all with a friendly, helpful green hex. Uh, our line of sight is determined by this sort of lit up area. I don't know if it impacts supply or not. Like supply and encirclement are a thing, but they seem a little bit difficult to track. It'll, you'll get a friendly little pop-up when you surround an enemy unit, it'll say encircled, but it's really hard to track like actual supply lines or anything like that in this game, so I'm not clear, and I haven't been able to find like any hotkeys in the options to show like supply or anything like that. So I'm not quite sure how that all works, but that's for another time. So you can see here we're in the Northern Poland map. We can zoom out, zoom out to a strategic map, um, or we can just click here. We also have an option to zoom even, well, it's the same map. Um, so these are our three objectives. I think this might be a secondary objective up here in the north, but I think the primary thing we're going to do here is we're going to drive against these Polish infantry here with our two Polish infantry units up here in the north to attack them. Uh, but the first thing I'm going to actually do is I'm going to use my uh, Stuka, my uh, JU-87B here, my uh, Stuka dive bomber. We're going to fly up here, and then we're going to go ahead and bomb these infantry. So we flew the aircraft over the enemy target, and when we hover our mouse over the target, you'll see a 0 minus 3. The 0 represents how many casualties the game thinks we will take. The negative 3 represents how many casualties it thinks the enemy will take. So the gray being the Germans, it's estimating 0 German casualties three Polish casualties. So we'll go ahead and click to confirm the bombing. You get a little graphic there and you can see a five heart and a one sort of broken heart. The five heart represents the fact that the enemy took five casualties. Uh, the one um, broken heart represents suppression. So if we click on the unit, we can see this is the six Polish infantry. Down here we can see they're a potential 10 out of 15 strength. That's because they took the five casualties when we bombed them, and they currently suffer from one suppression. So as units become more suppressed, they inflict less casualties, and they become less effective. Other things here are fuel, which matters if you have trucks with you, uh, ammunition, uh, which is obviously how, much, how many bullets they have to shoot at you, and entrenchment. So these guys are not entrenched. They're suffering one uh, suppression, and they've suffered five casualties. So with that being said, we're going to go ahead and we're going to move our Grenadier Infantry here, the 9th Grenadiers, up to bordering this Polish unit here. And it says when we attack that it's estimating we will lose two, uh, two casualties while the enemy will lose five. But there's actually a stacking bonus as well. So we're actually going to move both of our Grenadiers here. And now if we attack here, it's going to be considered a mass attack because we have two adjacent units that haven't attacked yet. And so that gives us some kind of bonus, although it looks like the, the odds are still the same. So we attacked again, they lost five, no suppression, we lost one casualty and one suppression. So you can see there are five to one result. Uh, we're going to attack again now because the enemy didn't retreat, and this time it's estimating one to four. So we'll go ahead and attack there, and we'll see the little pop-up says five hearts, one suppression. We lost two casualties, but we wiped out the enemy unit there. So um, it looks like actually our base for our infantry units are 15, while our armored units are a base of 10. But in any event, we inflicted four to, five to one casualties on that, and now you can see here the enemy infantry unit is dead on the field, and it does represent like a, a dead sprite up there. Um, okay, so we destroyed the one Polish unit that we know is on the map. Actually, there's another one down here. It's an anti-tank gun, a 37 millimeter anti-tank gun. So we're going to go ahead and take our strategic bomber here, and we're going to fly it over to the anti-tank gun, uh, and we're going to drop bombs on it. 
So it looks like the strategic bombers didn't actually do any damage to the enemy unit, but it did give them th level 3 suppression, which is going to make them far less effective. Uh, it looks like... Yeah, I'm not sure what like each level of suppression means, but it, it does look like the enemy did suffer suppression. So we're going to go ahead and move this infantry up here adjacent to the enemy. We're also, before we do that, we're going to move our artillery up this way. And so our artillery can move and shoot at the same time. And so we'll go ahead and bombard them. It looks like we're going to inflict two more suppression on the enemy. So they are good, well and good suppressed or whatever. Um, so we're going to go ahead and attack them next. One other thing is when you move aircraft and you bomb an enemy unit, it doesn't look like there's any way to move the bombers off the hex. And there is stacking limits, so I can't fly like my fighter over the bombers here and, uh, and strafe them further. So uh, it does appear like you're limited to one air attack per turn. Anyway, so the enemy's suppressed. We're going to go ahead and launch an infantry attack against them. We lose one suppression against them. They lose one health point and one more suppression. Um, so one other thing worth calling out is infantry that have trucks can move a lot further. So when you see this little circular dot, that means you can move and attack, basically. It means you're essentially marching on foot. If you move to where the trucks are, you can do that, but you will actually be mounted up on a truck, which makes you very vulnerable and exposed because if the enemy attacks you when you're mounted up on trucks, uh, you're much easier to kill. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, armor obviously doesn't have to worry about that, but the infantry units that have uh, actual um, uh, trucks, is that is something you need to balance. So some of our infantry have trucks, some of them do not. All right, so we attacked the enemy successfully here. Um, and we've sort of suppressed them. I'm going to move these guys around to the flank. Now, it did just give us a little pop-up saying the enemy's encircled, and when I hover over this unit, it does appear like they're encircled in this little green pocket, but it, I, I had no way of knowing that I was encircling the enemy, so I, I don't know what that means other than to say now the enemy is going to suffer a uh, encirclement attack, which means they're going to be less effective in the defensive. They lost four casualties, three more suppression. Uh, they did retreat, so their suppression, I guess, dropped uh, since they moved. But we'll launch another attack there. Uh, we'll take some casualties, but we will drive them back. Our other armor is going to race after these guys and try and finish them off as we try and break through the enemy line. And there you go. The enemy is surrendered. So what was left of the enemy unit surrendered. And actually, we got some prestige for destroying and forcing the enemy units to surrender. So that's a good result. Meanwhile, this other armored unit up here, these Panzer II Cs, are going to drive to this town uh, to take it. It's not a key objective town, but we will still get prestige bonuses for taking it. And we're going to take these two Grenadier Infantry units and this armored unit, and we're going to set them up in a blocking position along this northern road in the event the, the, Germ the Polish kind of moves south against us. Uh, we're also going to move this guy via a truck. I'm hoping they're safe. They're going to kind of be stuck between multiple units, so I'm hoping the enemy doesn't come after us. So we'll try and move them a, a greater distance here uh, via truck. And then we'll go ahead and fly our fighters out here uh, for reconnaissance to see what they can see. I don't see anything out front of me in this direction, so that's a good sign. There's no indication of the enemy having more troops out that way. Now, usually you can use options for like next unit or previous units. There's hotkeys or there's buttons down here on the right, but we've now moved every one of our units. So with that being said, let's go ahead and move to turn number two. So we'll go ahead and end our turn. You can see the Polish have brought in some strategic bombers of their own, which have inflicted three suppression on our troops there. Uh, they didn't actually inflict any casualties. They have some armored cars there, which counterattacked our armor to the south, although it looks like we got the better of the exchange. They have some cavalry attacking our tanks in this town up here in the north, uh, and we got a slightly advantageous exchange, five to three. Uh, in any event, they did some damage to us up there with their first Polish cavalry, uh, the historic Lancers charging, charging the, uh, charging the uh, tanks. Meanwhile, the enemy bombers are still over our tanks down here. One thing you will also notice is aircraft are based out of individual air bases, which I really like. The idea of having a plane flying around and operating on a fixed point on a map doesn't seem right even though that's how most turn-based games tend to operate. In this case, these aircraft are all based out of specific air bases back here in the rear, and if you want to change the air base it's based out of, you actually click Rebase Aircraft, and then you can tell it where you want them to go. So at the end of every turn, uh, the aircraft will fly back to the air base, and that also basically directly influences. I can only fly to here. If I fly here, 
I can't fly further next turn. I can only fly to a certain range out of the airbase. And so I think that's a really nice feature that seems to more, again, in my opinion, more accurately reflect the realities of air combat. You're not going to be moving halfway across Russia over three days. You're going to be pl based out of whatever your airfield is. And, you know, if you want to move forward, you've got to rebase closer to the front. Meanwhile, our BF-109 is going to come up here and attack the enemy strategic bombers. You can see we inflicted five casualties for none of our own. I don't know how suppression works for bombers, um, but in any event, it looks like we suppress them. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move my Stuka. Do I want to go after the armored car down here? Or we'll go after the cavalry up here in the north. So we'll go ahead and bomb them. We also did detect another enemy infantry unit up here in the north. We inflicted five casualties on them. Uh, and then we're going to use our strategic bomber down here in the south against these enemy armored cars. And there you go, two more suppression against them. So, with that being said, let's move our infantry out here against the enemy cavalry. We'll probably drive them. No, oh, wow, we destroyed them. We just mowed them down with our grenadiers. So we'll keep kind of moving in the north there along that line. These uh, armored units are going to go ahead and re, uh, reinforce. So we'll go ahead and hit the R key. Uh, to reinforce them, and they get back to up to 10 strength. They do suffer suppression when you call in reinforcements. Presumably that represents, like, disorganization and other things like that as, you, as you're bringing in new troops or, or what have you. But uh, a nice little bonus there for us. And then we're going to actually take this 4th Panzer unit here and drive it north as well. We're not going to have it attack this Polish infantry unit here, but it is hopefully going to sort of head off any Polish attack against these reinforced troops uh, to buy them a little bit of time. Um, okay, so now in the south versus this enemy armored car, uh, we're going to go ahead and attack with uh, the Panzer 38 TA. We'll drive the enemy back. Four casualties, two suppression. Uh, we'll pursue them a little bit. I should have waited for my, uh, my artillery to come online. But we'll move this infantry down here toward this town. I don't even know what that town is, but we just got 50 more prestige for doing that. Our infantry will advance to the east. Our grenadiers to the south. So we'll go ahead and attack these guys. We'll go ahead and attack them with the infantry, lose some casualties. And then I think we'll pursue them this way with our armor. Or drive at them, but we can't finish them off. So I'll move these guys via their trucks, and then I'll move these uh, artillery via their trucks. So we're moving uh, south with a big chunk of our force driving on this first objective. Then we'll cross this bridge and come at these two cities from the rear. Uh, meanwhile, um, in the north, we're going to have these sort of four or five units drive along this roadway, eliminating the threat to our flank while also driving on this uh, Polish town up here uh, in the north. So I think that's everybody. The only thing is that these guys could attack if they want, but I, I don't I don't like that exchange. So we'll go ahead and undo that. Meanwhile, their strategic bombers go back to the base. Then they come back and attack. Their cavalry is going to attack our lead elements of uh, armored. Six to two casualties there. Pretty heavy casualties for the enemy. Meanwhile, uh, we're losing casualties. That armor of ours is actually encircled and being driven back, although they haven't died yet. So that's good. Um, we need to try and save them. So we're going to bring our infantry forward here. Um, we're also going to bring our air units up here to try and save the day. So first thing, we'll go ahead and bomb these guys. I guess I'd rather bomb the cavalry just because we'll get more bang for our buck there. So we'll go ahead and inf uh, bomb the cavalry first. We'll bring our strategic bomber up here in the north as well. To suppress these guys, these 15 hit points, they're the strongest of the enemy. Once we suppress them, then we'll attack. Pretty heavy casualties, although we lost reasonably heavy too. Um, move this infantry up here. The enemy infantry is encircled, so they lose heavy casualties. We'll go ahead and attack them. Did we finish them off? No. We drove them back. We didn't finish them off. So hopefully those uh, those tanks don't get destroyed. And then we'll use our fighters here to sweep south to take out these enemy strategic bombers. 
And we didn't quite destroy them, but we did, did a good amount of damage. Our infantry will chase this armored car here toward this first of the objectives in the south. Should finish them off. And there you go. Now, you can move artillery one hex and then still fire the same turn, but you can't move them two turns, uh, two hexes, and still fire. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, we'll move this armor this way, and we'll move this here. So we have a massive encirclement going on on this enemy city down here in the south, um, or at least a massive sort of stacking up against them. Four units all aligned against this one anti-tank gun. It is dug in, however. They're entrenched at level five. Infantry can very effectively undermine enemy uh, anti-tank guns. So we'll go ahead and overrun them there. We'll take that objective. And we've taken the first of our three objectives here in a massed assault against the enemy. We also want to move forward here and take this airfield in the south so we can rebase some of our aircraft in the south to operate against the enemy's main objectives. But that was a good result for us there as we succeeded in uh, sort of overwhelming the enemy down there. Oh, I forgot. I still have one more infantry unit here. So we'll go ahead and move this infantry unit up here. Even though I don't like the idea of a 3 to 5 exchange, I will gladly do it if it means maybe saving this uh, this tank unit here. Because again, if the enemy is uh, reduced in, in strength, they may be less likely to attack us. So we inflicted 6 casualties for 4 of our own, it looks like. Or maybe 3 of our own. And uh, all these enemy troops are now below half strength. So hopefully they don't decide to attack us. Actually, these infantry can still attack. So we almost destroyed those guys, too. So really, there's only two units that could potentially pose a threat. And I think that does it for turn number three, so we'll move to turn number four. So the enemy strategic bombers don't look like they're in any mood to reinforce. Oh, an enemy counterattack with armor in the south. They're coming up behind us. That infantry unit there in the south is not, uh, or I guess the south of the north, is not in, in great shape. Oh, boy. They, oh, okay, apparently the 2nd Vera Infantry is, uh, has been decorated with a heroic defense level 1. So they were attacked three times that turn, and they were not destroyed. So I guess that's heroic. Uh, good job, boys. And uh, there you go. So that's a good result. Meanwhile, we'll go ahead and attack there. We'll hopefully finish that infantry unit off with our armor in the north. Yep, destroyed them. We'll move our... Oh, God, those guys can't get down there. Move our infantry down here to deal with this enemy cavalry. Hopefully finishing them off. Nope, not quite. Um, move our armor south. Four to one. All right, I'm actually going to drive this armor north. to try and finish off these enemy units here. So we overran those guys. Oh, nice. When you overrun, you get to attack twice. So that armored unit successfully overran two enemy units, destroyed two enemy units, and the only thing they've got left in the in sort of this counterattack along this main roadway is this one armored unit. Um, so that's great. Meanwhile, this infantry is going to take the bridge across the Vistula, this infantry is going to move forward and take this airfield. They're going to move on their trucks. And then the artillery is going to move closer in as well. Move these infantry to the front. And we're going to kind of start flanking and crossing the road behind these other two objectives as we attempt to close in on the enemy. Meanwhile, they do have one uh, enemy bomb or one. This bomber unit here should be finished off by our BF-109. And it is. We shoot it down. Our Stuka, meanwhile, is going to fly up here against this enemy armor. Cripple, if not destroy. So, four casualties inflicted. And then we're going to go ahead and we're going to rebase the strategic bomber down here to this forward airfield that we just took. And so, it will move up here uh, for its turn. Much closer to the front so it can hit any of the targets on the southern part of the battlefield. Meanwhile, we're going to... I'm going to drive my grenadiers out here. That's pretty risky. If the enemy has any troops that they can counterattack with, these guys could be sitting ducks. But I like the idea of getting closer to this 
uh, objective up here in the north, or the city, not objective. And then these troops here who are at 40% strength, we're going to go ahead and reinforce. We could go with elite reinforcements, which would, cost us, which would cost us 98 prestige and give us plus 7 strength. It will keep their experience up, which is good. They've already won an award. If we go with regular replacements, it'll cost us 40 less prestige, uh, but we'll lose about more than half of our experience. Uh, so in this case, I think I'll keep the ex the uh, elite reinforcements because I want to, you know, th these guys have one heroic defense medal. So I want to keep these these guys, uh, their experience up there as much as we can. Um, with that being said, is anybody else still to move? Doesn't look like it. So we'll go ahead and end the turn and move to turn number five. I don't also fully understand how these little these little black boxes showing up influence anything. When I first I played through the scenario once, and when I played through it the first time, I thought they were like indicative of supply, but I really think it's just fog of war. Um, you can run through supply. You can see these tanks here are starting to run run through their fuel. Reinforce those guys with just regular reinforcements. These grenadiers are going to move north, and they're going to close in on that objective. We're going to have this armor is low on fuel, actually, so we're going to keep them in the south. This is where picking a, a, a trait that is, is weak in logistics will come, come to haunt me. Uh, so we'll move this infantry here in the south. I think we'll cross, we'll try and cross the river. It doesn't look like I can cross the river with any of these guys. So we'll move these guys behind the bridge. Uh, this infantry will finish off this enemy. Move these armor units in the north. So we're going to move these three to four units toward this objective in the north. We'll move everybody else into the south. I don't think there's any enemy troops left in uh, sort of along this northern flank. So I'm going to go ahead and sort of rebase my all of my air, air to the south. Because it's the only Ford airfield I have. I'll go ahead and move these guys over here. They'll start suppressing these enemy troops. I don't want to lose six casualties. So I think we'll kind of play this turn a little bit more passively. You can see here we still have our max core slots of 36 and we have, we're up to 621 prestige. An armored unit here comes and counterattacks in the south against our infantry here. Our infantry gives a good account of itself, about one-to-one -one casualties. Some enemy infantry is attacking our grenadiers in the north. A slight advan advantage for us. And then our uh, troops that were on trucks get ripped apart by enemy armor uh, that catches them mounted up. So that's the risk of moving your units mounted. We just saw that. We'll pull... These guys back. Can I... Well, actually, I'm just going to see if we can... Yeah, we're just going to attack like that. So, three attacks against the enemy, just inflicting large casualties, sort of hoping we can kind of overwhelm them slowly. And we did. We did a fair amount of damage, destroyed about half their strength there. Meanwhile, our Stuka in the south is going to go for the enemy armor that looks almost like a World War I tank with its track there. If we zoom in here, you can see it's it's almost almost like a World War I tank there. I know that is, I think, a uh, Polish World War II tank, but it just looks kind of weird. Um, and then we'll go ahead and fly our, uh, our strategic bombers over there. We'll fly our fighters over here to try and suppress. There's an enemy artillery unit here. So if you do attack an enemy unit that's in range of the enemy artillery, they do fire effectively suppressive fire. That will be problematic for you. Um, then we'll go ahead and bombard these troops. So we'll suppress them there. We'll go ahead and attack with infantry. Our infantry attack actually drove the enemy out, so now we can move our armor in. We'll take that second objective. We'll get 100 prestige. We'll drive them back. Our other armored unit here is very low on supply. Okay, so I don't think they're going to be able to counterattack with much. 
but it does look like logistics is starting to become a problem because you can see I can only move some of these armored units a couple of hexes, and that's because, like, in these case, these guys are completely out of fuel. So I think that'll... do it. These guys can still move, but I'm not actually going to move them. So those two guys can move, but not attack. So we'll move forward to turn number seven. The enemy counterattacks at Kemlino, or however you pronounce that. They move an anti-tank unit down there. Uh, does some casualties, but not disastrous. Meanwhile, they move their infantry south and circle these infantry the north. Nearly destroy that grenadier unit there and drive them back. Meanwhile, their armor attempts to go directly at our artillery, but our artillery drops the... Uh, Drops the barrels there, fires direct fire on the enemy, and suppresses them. Um, Alright, so these guys are at four. Right, so we're going to attack that. So we drove them back. Heavy casualties. We'll finish them off. We overran them. Then our infantry here is unencircled, I think. We'll go ahead and reinforce these troops. Just regular reinforcements. Same for these guys. Alright, so we'll reinforce in the north this turn. After those successful attacks, we'll continue our attacks in the south. I think we'll... I don't want to hit them with strategic. Yeah, I'd rather go with the... Uh, Stukas against meaningful stuff. So go ahead and suppress their artillery, hit their anti-tank guns with Stukas, and then strafe their tanks. I guess we'll go ahead and advance here. How do these guys have no fuel? They like get one fuel through per turn? That's it? Right, so our, our tanks drive the enemy anti-tank guns back. Meanwhile, our troops in the south there will attack that enemy tank unit there and destroy them without loss. And then our infantry will cross the river here. Move this artillery up. And we'll slowly move on the final enemy objective. Where There's a reasonable amount of enemy strength around there, but I think with the air and the artillery support that we have coming in, we should be able to overwhelm them relatively easily. I don't know if the northern objective matters at all, but we'll just kind of keep progressing there. So there the enemy artillery bombarded our infantry. We'll see if they followed up with an attack. Infantry there launched a very ineffectual attack. So go ahead and attack there. I will move them here. Move those troops up in the north. Okay, so we are now closing in on the last enemy objective in the north there. I guess it's not actually an objective, but in any event, the last enemy city there. We're going to go ahead and use our um, tactical stukas here against the enemy artillery. those. All right. So we'll swing around the enemy flank here with our armor. Attack that enemy artillery. Then we'll attack with our own armor, which only has one fuel, so it's nice that it can't actually move very far. But it can move one hex and attack twice. So destroyed them. Trying to move my troops into position here for a uh, massed attack on the enemy, the final enemy objective next turn, which will probably be what happens. We'll see if we if we need to bomb the city in the north. I'd like to take both objectives. I just don't think I'm going to have the strength in the north to take it next turn. All right, so the enemy actually attempted to launch a counterattack down there. They inflicted some casualties on us, but we 
We inflicted them right back, so I guess if I was the enemy, I would not be launching attacks out of a city that you are surrounded in and massively outnumbered. But they did, and that worked to our advantage. Alright, let's move this infantry here. Let's reinforce these guys. Move our artillery into range and start shelling the city. All right, so we can probably in the next turn or so launch an effective attack here to eliminate the last enemy city. I'm actually going to see if my bombers can hit the north first. They can, so we'll go ahead and use our Stukas against the enemy city up there. Doesn't actually do any damage to them. I guess that they lose one of their entrenchments. All right, so we're going to launch our attack with our overstrength infantry there. A little bit of casualties against them. They also lose a little bit of entrenchment. Um, we'll go ahead and end our turn. The enemy's going to launch another attack. And they actually drove our infantry back there in the south. We're turn 10 out of 15. Um, move our infantry up this way. So we'll launch... We're going to lose heavy casualties in all of these attacks here. The enemy did not retreat. Move our artillery will bombard. Can our Stukas finish them off up there? Probably not. Nope. In any event, we should be able to finish them next turn. I don't have any orders that say, like, you get a major victory if you win by this point. So I don't know if delaying actually matters at all. Alright. I'm going to max out our troops in the south in terms of their experience there. It looks like those those tanks that didn't move are gaining a little bit of their supply back. And so... Yeah. Alright, let's go ahead and end this turn. Move forward to turn number 11. The enemy counterattacks out of the city in the north, which seems foolhardy. Although they had a slight advantage there in terms of numbers. But we should overwhelm them, and we do. We drive them back. We take the city gain 50 prestige. Definitely not worth the cost in casualties. But we'll get an extra 100 prestige between the two, which I literally just spent 62 prestige and 119 prestige rebuilding these, these men that took casualties in the north. So that was not worth it. Uh, meanwhile, in the south, we'll go ahead and bombard. We'll bring our Stuka in. We'll try and keep this as cheap as possible in terms of manpower. One to seven. And we wiped him out. Eight to one, actually. And then we win. So there you go. A victory in the first battle in the Poland campaign. You get a summary over here of the experience gain, the number of heroes or, or whatever, medals, points cost. You can see we did win one medal for the second Vare. That was the only medal. I guess the heroes are something different. Um, points cost killed. The Stuka was the most valuable at 415. Not a huge surprise. The BF-109 was second, probably because they shot down the enemy strategic unit. In terms of points lost, are least efficient. You can, I mean, you can look through all of this information. Kills, loss, ratio, all those other kind of things like that. Apparently, the uh, artillery was the least effective, although mostly they probably because they suppressed uh, as opposed to actually killing. Uh, but there you go. That's a victory there in the first battle of the uh, Panzer Corps II campaign. We'll probably play the second battle uh, in our in a, in a live stream either tonight uh, or, or yeah, I'd say like maybe 10.30 Central Standard Time tonight, uh, that being um, uh, Tuesday, um, late Tuesday. Um, you can see here we're moving toward the Bug River for our next, uh, next battle. I'm actually going to go ahead and, I don't want to end, I don't know if I want to end briefing, but Oh, military commendation. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and we'll save.
and then we'll we'll jump back in next time. But anyway, that was our our first look at um, Panzer Corps II, which is a turn-based strategy game that's going to be launching by Slytherin and Matrix Games on March 19th. This is a preview build of the game, so it's not a final version of the game. Um, it is uh, a 3D-based Panzer Corps game, so it's obviously the graphical uh, engine is, is certainly enhanced over the 2D version of the game, um, but it is uh, very much a Panzer Corps game, if you will. Uh, there's a lot that they changed. It, it feels very different, and I, I think it's probably a little too early to, to weigh in with an opinion, um, but that's uh, that's the game that we played today. So let me know your thoughts below. Let me know if this is something you think looks interesting or, or not, and uh, we'll continue this series uh, probably in a Twitch live stream at about 10.30 Central Standard Time, I believe, unless I'm too tired because uh, it's going to be a long day at work. Uh, but I would plan for 10.30 Central Standard Time uh, stream time on my Twitch channel, uh, The Historical Gamer. Uh, I'll link in the description. Um, but yeah, I'm interested to hear your thoughts. Uh, and that was our first look at Panzer Corps 2. Until next time, guys, this is The Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.